So today, we're gonna tuft a rug. I wanna show you how to do it. So I've tufted about four rugs now. Getting the hang of it, I think I got it kind of down, at least enough to show you guys how to get started. So this is a tufting gun right here. I got this from tuftinggun.com. I think previously you known as Tuft the World. It's loved, it's used, you can kind of see, maybe you can see, there's a lot of little like yarn fuzzies and things in there. But these things are pretty intense. So at the lowest setting even, these things are super dangerous tools if you're not careful. Essentially a pair of scissors comes out, yarn is fed through here, pushes it into the cloth itself, cuts it, and basically stitches it in, and that's how the rug's made. So the settings on this thing are pretty rudimentary. This is the lowest setting. Like, it's pretty fast. The highest setting. It's like hard to hold at that speed. So I usually turn it all the way down. That's, that's usually what I start with, and then as I get tired of holding this thing or I'm trying to move quickly through a section, I'll bring the power up. It's a pretty great tool. It's super fun to work with. You might also want to pick up some other equipment to make your life easier. This is a pair of duckbill scissors. Super great for just getting like little pieces here and there that are replaced, yarn that's too long, that sort of thing. General fabric scissors also, those are great. I keep mine on this little lanyard chain here and I keep it right at my station, just hang it up right next to it. Whenever I need to grab it, I can grab it. I use this to cut the topping cloth and you know, just bits of yarn here and there as well. A little bit easier with the longer shear length on that. So, I've already done a couple rug designs and you guys have probably seen them on Instagram if you follow me on there. If not, it's down there at Wolfbits. What are you doing? Go do that already. But I'm gonna show you some of those and what I've kind of learned so far. And I definitely have made a lot of mistakes, so we'll go over some of this as well. So this is the very first one I actually made. This is a little cupy head design that I had, kind of kicking around, and whenever I try anything new, I never do anything easy, because why would I? I always go for something that's way too difficult for the first project, but I'm actually really happy with how this came out. People seem to really like it as well. I've had a couple of commission requests to do this same rug design, just in different colors. So I definitely plan to do more of these. I love this kind of thing, you know, bringing a lot of that love of tattoo flash and tattoo imagery into weird kind of just strange objects like rugs. And I think these are pretty cool. So that was the very first rug I did. All right, second rug. So what's the deal with this thing? This weird banana peel. This thing's just not done yet. So pretty much everywhere has run out of the actual backing material and felt you need to back rugs. So these aren't finished. But this is my second rug and it is glued up. And I'm gonna just call it done for now because I just don't have the materials to keep going. But love the concept, love the idea. I thought it was really funny. Just a classic banana peel as a rug. Why not? Okay, so design number three. This one's uh, near and dear to my heart. This is a classic Rust-Oleum Rusto Fat is what they're known as. It's a type of spray cap for graffiti writers. It's got an orange center in it. It sprays similar to how a New York fat does, but it worked on the traditional rust -Oleum cans. And you can use it on a lot of European paint as well. Uh, anyone that's into graph or like mural stuff that's into this stuff knows what this is. I am still working on this one. This is actually just a scrap piece because the frame itself, which I'll show you guys afterwards, it's actually really difficult to get super close to the edge and stuff, and that's like what I learned with this. This is a section I had open left from the banana peel, so I decided to fill it and made this and really experimented with the carving and stuff like that with a pair of just normal hair clippers. And I gotta keep working on it, but I like it. Might become like a little back patch or something. I don't know, I wouldn't wear it, but someone might. Maybe you would. So here's another weird patch idea, kind of to fill things in. You probably can't even tell what this is. It's still gotta get cleaned up a little bit. I'm gonna call this one a failure, but this was supposed to be a little paper airplane and it just fit into a little groove spot. I don't wanna waste the cloth, so I'm like, you know what, uh, let me try to make this little airplane patch. Didn't work out. That one, send that one into the garbage. The last work in progress rug is this little corner section cobweb rug and it's all warped and crazy because I just glued it a couple days ago and it has no backing like the other ones. But I love this idea. Again, the corner of the frame just had a bunch of room in there from that banana design. Decided to do these little cobweb rugs, which I think is gonna be today's inspiration for what rug I'm gonna do. I'm gonna probably do a full circle cobweb rug. 
Alright, enough showing off and showing you my random shit. Let's get started on making a rug. So, first, things you're going to need. Obviously, tufting gun. Other helpful tools to have. Sharp scissors. Other things you're going to need, yarn. Tufting frame and also your tufting fabric. So, here we are. We have a tufting frame. This is from the kit, also from Tuft the World or tuftinggun.com. So this was it right here. Pretty sturdy. I'm only being a little sarcastic. Not bad for like a first go in a starter frame. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually mount the cloth on here. And I forgot the large tripod, of course, so we're gonna have to figure that out together because I can't do this one-handed. Okay, so I've gone ahead and actually added the fabric to the frame itself. It has a little bit of play to it, slight give. It's kind of like stretching a canvas if you've ever done that before, but instead of having to pull it and staple it down, you're just trying to hook it onto these little tiny tack strips here along the entire frame and you're trying to keep it as straight as possible. You want to be careful of things like this, where you over tighten it and you accidentally pull strands too far apart. When you're tufting, if you have these, try to stay away from them if you can. It's something that might create a larger tear down the road. Now I like to inspect mine for any imperfections or areas that could possibly be tightened up a bit more. We have this thing pretty tight on this frame to the point where it's almost too tight. But we're gonna have most of the design in the center here. I like to run my hand over the actual cloth itself also to see areas that have high points of stress and tension. So these running lines here, they're a little bit different in texture. And sometimes when they really stand out and are super pronounced, it's a very tight area. So if we go into this area with the tufting gun, we're gonna actually run into a problem. We might actually tear the fabric because it's too tight but we don't want to pull it off and end up messing up all the tension. So it's kind of a mess around and see what works for you type of deal. And you'll eventually figure out the right amount of tension and pressure to put on something like this. But I'm pretty happy with that. So now we're gonna work on transferring a design and concept onto this actual material. Okay, so there are a couple ways that you can actually transfer design onto the actual tufting fabric. You can freehand draw it, you can do a grid system, you can do a projector, you can do whatever you want. Essentially all you need to do is transfer an actual image onto the material as a reference guide. If you're doing something with typography or lettering, words in general, you actually have to do them backwards because we're actually punching through the backside. So you're gonna to wanna to flip your graphic if it needs to go a certain way. So we're gonna be doing a cobweb today, a little spider web, and it's gonna be fairly symmetrical. And it's pretty much gonna be in a radial circular pattern. Now I could do this by hand and grab a bunch of tools and string and all that and do like the gridded out thing and hand draw it. Or I can take a sick cobweb of already drawn, throw it up on my iPad, use my projector and project it from across the room and just trace the lines that way. Which I think we're gonna do that method for this round, it's just gonna be a little bit easier. So we have the design basically figured out. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. Have the projector now set up right over here. Okay, so I've got the design transfer on here now. Just use a Sharpie, use a ruler for some of these straight lines. And the border I'm kind of unsure about, kind of wavy shapes around will probably be the best bet, but looking pretty good. Now the next step is to actually pick the colors out. Okay, so I picked out some yarn. We're going with that crazy bright pink. Got two skeins of yarn here. These are both just rolled from a larger skein into two different balls here. And then we're actually gonna just thread these two bits of yarn through here. Now, everyone kind of just suggests using the two strands and it has worked for me. So I don't think there's a need to uh, do less strands. I have heard of some people doing three, which I think is just a bit of overkill. A lot of yarn that gets wasted. And basically I wanna, basically what I do is I make sure that there's enough slack and then I can easily pull the yarn on these skeins. So when it's actually feeding into the gun, it can pull it pretty easily without too much tension. There we go. So that's plenty of yarn that's pulled off. 
decent amount here. And now we gotta thread the gun. So I'm gonna set this up somewhere so you guys can see me do that. Okay, so we're about to start tufting, but one of the main things you wanna do first is check your gun and actually oil your gun. So like a sewing machine or any other high speed piece of equipment that moves at a rapid pace like this thing does, you actually wanna lubricate it every time you use it before and after. So I got some sewing machine oil. This stuff here, ton of brands make it. It's very generic, it's cheap as hell. Make sure you use it, it's really important. So any of the areas that have high mobility, such as these little runner rails here, that's what I'm just gonna call them. You wanna just do a couple of dabs of the sewing machine oil. The machine is off, by the way. So keep that in mind. Any parts that have high amounts of sliding on them or anything like that, you just wanna lubricate them and make sure that everything's tip top and glide it nice and smooth. That's one of the biggest problems you're gonna run into with any of this stuff, is not having a lubricated machine can be really dangerous and can actually cause the machine to burn out and break and be sluggish and not cut right and all sorts of different things. So we're gonna turn the machine on. We have the oil on there. So that actually does a decent amount at making sure that the oil is well spread on those rails there. We're gonna do a little bit on the bearing here, on the housing, underneath the housing, just a little bit. Again, yeah, machine's off, flick it back on. So that's pretty much good to go. All right, so now we're gonna to try to thread this thing real quick. I actually forgot my threading tool. It's basically a larger version of a sewing needle threading tool with a little wire and whatnot. I have this little clay tool, it'll probably work just fine. So we're gonna try that. Now, usually I grab the two strands and I actually grab my scissors, the really sharp ones. Cut off the knots I made so I can find them inside the actual skein. You got the two strands here. So grab your tufting gun, your thread, your threading tool if you have one, and you're just gonna run it through. Make sure the machine is off, obviously. You don't wanna get hurt. So you run it through this first hole here, both strands here. It's pretty easy, you actually don't really need that threading tool. Let's drop it. You have two different strands of thread. You're gonna thread it through this hole right here, through the back side, or the side that you're looking down. So you thread that through. Next is another hole, which might be a little bit difficult to see through the actual needle. This is where you'd want that wire tool, the little loop tool, it's a little bit easier to work with. When I start tufting, I like to have a decent amount of length here. This will be cut off in the end, so this is just like what I start with. I highly recommend one of those standing mats if you're gonna be on a hard ground like this. This is all hard tile that's painted on top of. So it's like, looks like a finished floor, but it's not. It's all tile underneath this and it's super uncomfortable to stand on for more than, you know, 45 minutes straight. But we're, we've been here for a few hours. So we're gonna stand on this mat here to kind of help alleviate some of the pain that you have in your legs and your lower back from doing this. This rug is gonna take hours. It's not fast as a process at all. Even though that machine moves quickly, this is gonna take us quite a long time. So we're gonna set you up in a time lapse. Okay, I'm feeling kind of dumb. I did not press record for the first few lines, so <laughs> not much has uh, been going on. The gun actually unthreaded itself, so I gotta rethread it anyway. Now we're gonna start the time lapse over again once this is started up. Turn the gun off, rethread it, same process. We're just gonna do this whole thing. So just finished tufting all this. Looks pretty good. I'm still trying to figure out spacing and everything on these. Do a little bit of variation here. But if we go around to the actual front side of the actual rug, we can kind of check these areas. And we can see that it's dense enough and it really shouldn't be too much of a problem. So now all that's left to do is go by with these scissors here, the duckbill scissors that I talked about from before, and just go over where this excess stuff is and just cut it off. I also think I need to do something about my scissors because it was accidentally making a lot of loops and it's supposed to be a cut pile gun. So I think there might be something 
either with the type of yarn that I'm using or maybe the pressure I'm applying. I don't know, I'm still figuring it out. Okay, so I just went and sheared this down a little bit with the clippers. You can see it makes a lot of fibers. But what we're trying to do is actually reduce the amount of fibers that are gonna get stuck in the glue. Not terrible, it looks a lot better. It was uh, pretty crazy with a lot of hanging pieces sticking out, but this is plenty fine for what we need to do next. Maybe down here, like something like this, you'd probably wanna remove that. It's not the end of the world if you miss little things like that, but I'm just trying to get these things to look a little bit cleaner in every rug I make. So this is gonna be like the fourth rug. I don't really count the patches because they uh, haven't become a success yet. So they're just kind of like their own thing. It's a little different of a process, but that's pretty much everything there. These are all just the shavings and some of the yarn left over from actually tufting those last little sections from before, if you remember those. And now I also, the other reason I like to do the clippers on the backside is it shows me any areas that aren't as dense. So you can see like this area is not as dense as some of the other parts of the rug. Then I'll go over to the other side and I'll just kind of feel and, and see how bad it is, but it looks pretty good to me. So today we're gonna to be using Robert's Carpet Adhesive. This is the 3095 or the 3095. I kind of like this stuff a bit more because it's got a little bit of a tack to it. So when you actually cut the rug out, it's a little bit easier to stick everything down. You, know, you don't actually need to hot glue the edges. Um, it's kind of just one of those extra steps. And depending on how you're finishing it, it's really personal preference. This stuff is a little hard to open, so be careful. Don't want to hurt yourself. This stuff's kind of a mess. It's a little annoying to work with. You get it on your skin, you, you're only use rubbing it all to take it off. It's pretty strong stuff. It smells bad, like any type of adhesive like this does. There's not one that smells better than the other, in my opinion. They all kind of suck. So you can use any size you want. I'm gonna use this larger one. It's gonna cover more ground, and you guys will be able to kind of see me do that. And I'm just gonna smear it on. I've seen other people lately just using gloves in their bare hands. Well, what, their hands with gloves, I guess, to smear on the glue. That actually seems to work pretty well. But I'm currently out of gloves, and gloves are kind of in a big shortage still, kind of across the board. So I'm just gonna stick with this kind of a putty knife method it's been working for me so far. I got a couple different size putty knives too that I use. And I just want to make sure that I get the glue nice and well spread out. I'm going to go a little further past the actual rug. And I really want to make sure I lock it into all the fibers. So I go in a couple different directions with the glue, making sure that the glue gets in between everything. And there's no gaps. And I kind of spread it as thin as I can. The stuff does make kind of a mess, so be prepared. And you can see like a lot of the fibers in the glue from shearing it are getting into the glue. So that's why I really want to make sure I get all the glue into every little nook and cranny of this thing on the back side, just in case any uh, fibers kind of mess with the strength and integrity of it. And I really spread this out as thin as I can because I really want this to, you know, I want this to last. And make sure all these fibers are lock, really locked down in there. Not bad. All right, so that's pretty much everything covered right there. I got a little bit of the glue on my hand, so I'm gonna go wash that off in the slop sink. But a decent amount of glue on there. You really wanna make sure you get this thing covered, so be generous with it. Okay, so we actually have this back glued now. It's not dry yet, but we're gonna go through and we're gonna trim all these little long yarn fibers and things that have accidentally looped. We're just gonna go and try to clean up the best we can. Once the glue dries, we'll put this on the ground and we'll actually be able to shear it and carve into some of the details. 
I also like to pull out any of the uh, the weird yarn fibers that are in the wrong spot, stuff going into the pink, like this little black fiber. We're gonna probably pull that out if we can't cut it down. Okay, so that's pretty much all I can do right now on this rug until the glue dries a bit more. But let me just kind of show you what we did. So you can kind of see a lot of the little bits that have come off of this thing. There's still a lot to get, but it's going to be a little bit easier with the actual clippers to get in here. And a lot of this black, which looks like it's going into the pink, it's really not. It's actually just pushing in from being so tight in there. But once we go to trim this down, we'll see more of the pink. And it won't be, uh, you kind of see it there, see? It won't be as locked in there, so we gotta let that dry for a bit. Okay guys, so I'm back in the studio. It's been a couple days that this rug up here has been drying with the glue behind it. So we're gonna take it down. We're gonna show you how to kind of cut that stuff out. I want to show you guys how I shear them with the cheap shears. So get a bit more of a consistent pile height, get rid of some of these accidental loops. And I figured out an adjustment I can make on my actual top tin gun to help prevent that from happening. Just one of the guards is too far up. Sometimes it happens when they ship. Okay, so I've actually given it some thought. I'm probably gonna put the frame back up here just to get the initial cut going. Wasn't thinking before, but it would be a lot easier to do and to show you guys. So, put the frame back up. There we go. Not bad. Okay, we're just gonna clamp it down just for safety, right? That one's clamped, that one's clamped. I'm gonna grab a sharp pair of scissors and we're just gonna make a puncture and we're gonna cut roughly around the whole piece. You could take the whole piece off and cut it that way, but we're just gonna do like a rough cut on some of these areas just to try to make life a little bit easier, so. All right, so this is the whole thing right here, taking off the frame. You can kind of see it's a little bit of a mess here. We got a lot of excess fabric. I'm just gonna go around and trim off most of the excess. We still want a decent amount of fabric to actually cut and tuck over this area. So we just wanna make sure that we leave enough, but we don't want all this extra fabric getting in the way and causing all sorts of trouble and making a huge mess. So on the sides here or on the top, that's plenty of fabric to leave, but like this section here, we're gonna remove that. And I'm just using some fabric scissors, nothing super fancy or crazy. These are pretty cheap. All the materials and stuff for this will be linked below. So if you guys wanna grab some of these tools, you know, go for it. Okay, so now that we've actually gone ahead and trimmed this down a little bit, we're gonna start cutting into the side here. And we just want little tiny slits in here. There's a lot of adhesive, so it can be a little tricky. You might wanna actually get a heavy duty pair of scissors for this section if you're doing a lot of rugs. It probably can dull the crap out of these fabric scissors, but this is all I have right now in the studio. Now what I'm doing next is I'm actually gonna use the adhesive side to my advantage while I'm shearing this down. I'm pressing it down to the table, just like this all the way around. There we go. Sorry guys, I don't have the regular tripod with me in the studio. I always forget it when I come and it's just one of those things that's a little frustrating to bring around. This is what we got for now. So we got this ready to go. All the edges are basically sticking to the bottom. I might actually experiment and try this next time before I cut it out completely to have it stick because there's edges obviously that are gonna peel up a little bit. But I have these clippers here. These are just some cheap wall clippers. Get a plug version, don't get a battery operated one. They're gonna die too quickly before you can finish anything. It's gonna drive you nuts. So I like to start in one section and just work with the tool in one direction. Uh, as I go along and trim this thing up. I'll also grab my duckbill scissors here and any areas that really stand out to me that I can easily trim like this long piece of yarn here, if the camera will pick that up. 
I snip that stuff as I see it. Just makes life a little bit easier, but I want to make sure everything's pressed down everywhere. So I'm just going to firmly press it down. You can do this on the ground as well. If you have an area that's safe to do it, it's not going to damage your floor. All right, we got quite a bit of long pieces I can easily see and trim. And just, you want to make this as easy as possible for yourself so you're not going back and forth over and over again, making sure you trimmed an area, this, that, and the other thing. So, let's get started. Okay, got the clippers now. We're gonna turn them on, it's about to get loud. We're about to go into time-lapse mode. All right, this is taking way longer than it normally does. I think I might have tufted this a little too tight together, but <laughs> we're gonna keep going. There's already a massive amount of the shavings everywhere. And this clipper is starting to burn out a little bit. You can kind of hear the motor in there not really working super well. But we're gonna keep going forward, I guess. We're just gonna take our time. You don't wanna force the clippers too much. If you force them too much, it's gonna bog them down and it'll actually make them not cut and it'll clog them up and you'll have to actually kind of clear them out a little bit every once in a while. They weren't designed to cut yarn fiber like this. So you're gonna run into some issues. I do plan on getting a nicer pair of actual wool shears probably next week, they're like 50 bucks. And I'll just use these for detail spots and carving and stuff like that, but might be a little while before they actually arrive. Everything's been shipping super slow. So I'm just gonna get back to this and uh, I'll see you guys when I'm done with it because this is just gonna take forever and this is probably boring as hell. Okay, so I've been uh, shooting this thing for a while now. Probably too long. I pretty much got through everything. Now I have to go in and carve all this stuff out, but I just wanted to show you guys how much of a mess this is, like how much mess it actually makes. It's insane. These clippers, I've been running them so long, they're about to burn my hand. Uh, that's, not, that's not even like an exaggeration, they're super hot. So I'm gonna let those cool down for a minute before they actually catch on fire or something absolutely insane, but I figured I'd show you guys all this yarn fiber that's just never ending on this rug. So I got it pretty much at a decent point to take a break. I'm gonna take a vacuum of a shop vac, uh, the bucket head shop vac type thing. I'm gonna vacuum all this crap up and try to clean up the space a little bit before I have to leave. And we're gonna go in, once that's done, we're gonna detail with some scissors and the clippers again just to get the carving on the edges of the rug. So I already started to do it down here. Nice little bevel on there, just to kind of clean it up and get this thing looking a little bit more professional before I end up putting the backing on it. All right guys, so just finished shearing that rug down. Here it is on the ground. Foot for scale. Uh, I guess that doesn't really help. Huh? Uh, size, <laughs> size 10 and a half foot on, on said rug. Bam. So yeah, pretty stoked on that one. Came out pretty good. Backing material still sold out everywhere. I ordered some from someplace. Hasn't arrived yet. It's supposed to be here like a couple days ago. But, you know, that's the name of it. Now I'm gonna head out and head to the shop. So I'm gonna go hang out with my East and we're gonna actually design a rug for him. That'll probably be the next video, if you guys like this video. If not, I'm gonna make it anyway. So you better like this video.